I started hearing myself say the same phrase over and over whenever anybody asked me the most basic question of, how are you? I would hear myself say, I'm good, busy, but good, all the time. And as I noticed myself saying this phrase, I noticed other people saying some iteration of that as well. How many of you have said something like this so far this year? What about in the last month? How many of you in the last month have said, I'm so stressed? What about today? How many of you have experienced anxiety so far today? Fellow presenters, if you're not raising your hand, you're lying. <laughs> anxiety, stress, and busyness so dominate our current culture that it's actually considered evidence of a productive life to feel this way much of the time. Even with modern advances that are intended to make our lives less busy, so things like washing machines that keep us from having to hand wash and hang dry our clothes, intended to save time, even with all these advances, we still feel completely overwhelmed. We're not doing this, but it's all completely ubiquitous in our culture. We have these advances everywhere. It's, it's all part of a modernizing culture a globalizing economy, and a secularizing society. Even with these advances, we are busier than ever. Toxic stress is so rampant that it's leading to skyrocketing levels of anxiety, depression, and addiction. This begs the question, perhaps these advances of modernization, globalization, and secularization aren't actually the solutions. Perhaps they are contributing factors to the very problem. This is not a new idea. Modernity being a part of the problem has been posited by many, many thinkers. And the theory goes something like this. It's actually these very hands-on chores, like laundry, that give our brains the break we need. It's a meditative activity that requires enough attention that we're able to ignore our to-do list for a while, but it allows space for our mind to wander. Fear not, I am the mother of a three-year-old and a one-year-old. I'm not suggesting we get rid of our washing machines. That would be my demise. An even more common theory is that globalization is the culprit. So this theory suggests that we encounter through globalization people who are very different from ourselves, and it leads to a sort of identity crisis. It makes us wonder who we are in the world. We no longer have track of that. And additionally, we have information coming at us from all over the world. So we're seeing atrocities and tragedies happening in the news, and it leads to a simultaneous sense of urgency that we need to do something about this while also giving us a sense of helplessness, that there's nothing we actually can do. Even less than I'm willing to give up my washer and dryer, am I willing to give up my friends from different walks of life, my education, and my ability to travel? So if I'm not willing to give up modernization, globalization, that brings us to secularization, which is a really rarely acknowledged element of this transition that has led to raising levels of anxiety and depression. So secularization is that process by which we remove religion from the public sphere. Now I know you're all thinking, stop talking. Don't talk about religion. Religion is the last taboo we have left. I could stand up here and talk about sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and it would be fine, as long as I don't talk about religion. In fact, many of us have talked about those very things today. Luckily, I'm not up here to suggest that we all come to some shared belief system, hold hands and agree to it, and leave here with the panacea for all of our 21st century despair. In fact, I'm going to suggest the opposite. Rather than coming to a shared belief system, I want to bracket beliefs altogether for a moment. By bracketing belief when we talk about religion, we might be able to find a way to avoid throwing the proverbial baby out with the holy water. Scholars and practitioners of religion alike know that religion is about a lot more than belief. So those who study religion and those who are religious know that those beliefs are accompanied by sacred spaces, sacred stories, sacred rituals, and sacred communities. And perhaps if we can learn to re-engage these sacred things, regardless of beliefs, we might find a way to manage that anxiety for another day. So this begs the question, what do I mean when I say sacred? Scholars have talked about this for a really long time, and they've really boiled it down to a very simple idea. Sacred, in most practical circles when we're talking about these kinds of things, is boiled down to the idea of set apart. 
That's it. Now, it seems overly simplified that set apart is all sacred can mean, but that is what, in fact, we mean when we as scholars talk about the sacred. To help illuminate how this works, it's helpful to juxtapose it with something. So scholars have historically juxtaposed sacred with the idea of the profane. Now, profane isn't really a useful word in our current culture, and so I'm going to change that phrase for us. Instead of Mircea Eliade's definition that we see on this picture, we're going to juxtapose sacred with mundane. So mundane things are those typical daily boring tasks like brushing our teeth, going to the grocery store. Those aren't sacred acts. Sacred is something that pulls us out of that typical rhythm or typical structure. It's something that's set apart in this way. So maybe more helpful would be some examples. When we think of sacred, the most common examples we see are examples of sacred spaces. Sacred spaces still abound in our culture. Here in the top, you see a picture of the Blue Mosque in Istanbul, Turkey. So when you talk about something being sacred, this is a sacred space. When I was here, I ate lunch in the cafe outside. I could do what I wanted. But as I entered the mosque's grounds, it was important that I adhere to certain set-apart practices, such as covering my head. I could eat lunch outside and not cover my head. That was fine for me in my cultural space. But in that space, it was important for me to adhere to certain practices. Next to that, you see a picture of a, a passage from the Gospel according to Matthew, as it's illuminated in the Book of Kells, which is a sacred artifact in Ireland. This is an example of a sacred story. So a sacred story is not just a set of words that means nothing, or a story we see on the news, or a story that we read in popular literature, but a story that shapes who we are, a story that sets out norms and helps us create our ethical values. It's a story that helps us understand who we are as a community and who we would like to be as a community. Below that, you see a picture of hands tearing at bread. This is at Millsaps Shabbat gathering, which happens every Friday at Millsaps as the sun goes down. This is in the ancient Hebrew tradition of Shabbat, or Sabbath, that at the end of a busy week, we set time apart to pause and rest. At sundown on Friday through sundown on Saturday, we have Sabbath. It is a set apart sacred time. Now, the astute listener who was listening to Ralph Eubanks this morning knows that this line between secular and sacred is hazy. Because didn't he suggest that all stories on some level are sacred? All stories should be forming who we are. And this Shabbat thing, right? How is it this group of largely religion majors gathering in this ancient Hebrew practice, is that really different from a particularly good Hebrew Bible class with the same students that's moving and separate in some way? You're absolutely right. This line between sacred and secular is incredibly hazy. And this is perhaps not more obvious anywhere than in the Washington National Cathedral. This is a space that challenges a lot of our notions of sacred and secular. For example, what are we doing with a national cathedral in a country that's allegedly secular? But I'm not going to explore that today. What I want to look at is actually what's happening in this photograph. It's a photograph that was taken at the base of the altar in the National Cathedral, a very center of a sacred space to many people. But I know that when the photograph was taken, it wasn't being used in a sacred way, because I took that photograph while I was eating a sandwich. This was a photograph taken during sound check. You can see that the seats in the back are completely empty. There's no one in the cathedral other than the musicians way up at the front. And those musicians are just making sure that these overwhelmingly modern instruments can function in this space that's designed for choral music. You can see the guy in the shirt and tie. Now, that might look like sacred attire to some, but he's the choir director at the National Cathedral. If this were a sacred moment, he'd have on a lot of robes. This is not a sacred moment or a sacred space for these people. It is utterly mundane. Religious professionals have actually been at the forefront of this breakdown between sacred and mundane for some obvious reasons. The line for us between work and worship is very permeable. This has painted us into a tough corner because since the Reformation, right, the priesthood of all believers, there is no line. We've been working ourselves out of a job. I have a degree in sacred music, so if sacred music goes away, I'm in a tough spot. This is the most complicated part of what I'm talking about today. In an effort to ensure that the sacred did not go away, we as religious professionals decided we needed to draw a firmer line. This hazy line between sacred and mundane was no longer working, and so instead we drew lines between one another. We linked the sacred to the idea of belief. So a belief intrinsically is something that I believe, but you don't. If we all believed it, it would just be knowledge, right? Right? 
A belief or a practice that is sacred has become something that we do, but they don't. And so belief is intrinsic to the idea as we understand it, though it's not necessarily. So we drew these lines and it has driven us into the enclaves where we only explore big ideas with people with whom we already agree. Religion is the space where we talk about what matters most to us, but we're not allowed to talk about it in the public sphere. So we're not talking about the things we care about most with people who aren't already agreeing with us. There's no public way to do this, no communal discourse, and this solitude is part of what leads to that anxiety and depression. So how might we reclaim these spaces? This is happening in traditionally religious spheres in a lot of ways. This is a great example locally. This is the community labyrinth outside St. James Episcopal Church. It's outside the church. It's accessible to anyone who wants to use it. And it is, in fact, a Christian symbol in a way. Christians have used this labyrinth symbol for a long time as a means of stepping out of our mundane worlds into a moment of reflection. We walk a long path to nowhere other than our intuitive lives, and then emerge back from that path. And on the other side, we've had a sacred moment set apart from our daily lives. But this is a much more ancient symbol. Many of us link it to Greek mythology. The labyrinth is by no means the sole territory of Christians. And in fact, this symbol is pretty obviously accessible to anyone from any or no belief system. Another great example of this is the Hagia Sophia, right across the courtyard from the Blue Mosque. And the tall picture here when it was built, it was a Byzantine Orthodox church. And then it became a mosque when the country became Muslim. And then in the 1920s, when Turkey became a secular country, it became an officially secular, so no religion allowed, museum. And museums offer a great example of an interesting way that the secular can engage the sacred. Museums, like the ones that we're in, are this moment of stepping apart and thinking about who we are as people. Whether you're in the campfire area of this museum or the This Little Light Gallery of the Civil Rights Museum, we take a moment to take stock of who we are as a community, what is, separates us from other people but draws us together and draws us into relationship. The bottom picture in this slide is perhaps the most influential for me. This is Medgar Evers' home here in Jackson. This was what was utterly a mundane space in the secular world. It's where he parked his car, it's where he made his dinner until it became the site of a martyrdom. A leader of a movement was murdered here, and we now turn it into a national historic site as we are able to approach it. It is carved out and separate from the rest of the block, and it is a space where we are invited in. What I love about this space is that it doesn't draw lines between us. I am welcome at this space, but you might not have noticed I'm white. I'm still called into this space. This is a space that invites me to reflect on who I am and how I, as a white person, stand to benefit from those very structures that Medgar Evers lived and died to dismantle and what that can mean for me. And so how I am called to use that privilege in movement of justice. It's a space that we can use to come together as a community and help us understand where we are going. And if that is not a sacred space, I don't know what is. When I think about sacred ritual, what comes to mind in the secular way is the national anthem. Many have considered the national anthem sacred for a long time. In order to participate and be a true patriot, you must stand, you must cover your heart. You maybe even need to sing. But in recent years, this has been thrown into the spotlight as another group holds this sacred in a new way. By kneeling, it calls into the questions all of the values that we espouse as a country but may not be living up to. Another group is doing something very different that is at odds with that first group. In fact, the complete opposite according to most people. But it's not that the groups don't consider this act sacred. It's that they consider it sacred in different ways. And this sacred ritual in public, I think, illuminates the gravest danger of secularization. For about 200 years, as long as Mississippi's been in existence, we've been trying to relegate religion from public discourse. We have silenced the role that it plays in our motives, but silencing it has not eliminated it. Religion continues to be the hidden motivator behind many of the choices that we make, many of the behaviors we engage, and many of the policies we create. We just aren't admitting that. We've created a silence around it that creates chasms, making it impossible for us to communicate with those we don't already agree with. Our deepest beliefs, whether they're religious or political or otherwise, aren't welcome in the political discourse, in the public conversation. 
which drives us back into those enclaves, those echo chambers with others that believe already like we do. Or even worse, it might drive us into a corner where we're completely alone. And in that solitude is where we encounter that extreme depression, anxiety, and despair. So what do we do? How do we create spaces in a secular world, bracketing belief, that allow us to be in authentic relationship with one another where we can have these conversations of actual substance and meaning? It can be as simple in the top of this picture as the common meal. Invite people into conversation with you around a table. Break bread together and share conversation about things that are different. Maybe someone from a different religion, maybe a different race, maybe a different part of the country, maybe a different country altogether. It doesn't have to be completely debilitating to do this. Or it can be huge and massive, as massive as marches that move millions of us out of our homes and into the streets and other communities. These can be huge endeavors or small endeavors, but moments where we take a chance to converse with other people and be with other people about things that really matter. It can be as simple as standing in solidarity, as you see in the bottom here in the Millsaps Bowl, with people who are marginalized in some way in our culture, whether or not you are part of that culture. It's a moment where we raise up the practices of that marginalized and silenced group. For in this example, uh, this was the prayer vigil in, at Millsaps, uh, where we were honoring Muslim heritages. And it was the first time in my existence in Jackson, I live in Belhaven, where I heard the call to prayer, the Muslim call to prayer, ring out over speakers and resound through my neighborhood as though I were back in Istanbul. It was amazing to feel those cultures come together and see other people engaged in their ritual practice in a thorough way and give me the privilege of being allowed to have access to that. The secularization process of the last 200 years has enabled this. We are indebted to it. I'm not saying that it's worthless. The secularization process created common spaces where we can step into the sphere and see one another. But seeing one another, mere coexistence, is no longer enough. If we're going to progress in the next 200 years, we need to find a way to bring our true selves, our true beliefs, our true values into these conversations so that we can begin to engage our differences, not from a place of fear, but from a place of gratitude. Thank you. <laughs>